Well, thank you very much, Gustavo, for the, the introduction. It's a pleasure to um, contribute to this very uh, prestigious series. I should uh, admit right from the start that I'm not yet um, a fully paid up member of the conceptual engineering um, industry. I was going to say cottage industry, but it has long since moved way beyond that. Um, but uh, let me just uh, indicate uh, from what angle I'm approaching this uh, topic. As Gustavo mentioned, I am interested in metaphilosophy and uh, I've long since tried to explain uh, uh, what conceptual analysis, uh, you know, is or might be. Um, that's, so that's one uh, road into this. I'm also uh, very interested in concepts, partly because I'm working uh, on the philosophy of animal mind and the question whether certain uh, cognitive capacities presuppose concepts and whether animals can possess concepts, you know, is, is pertinent. And a third reason is that one of my teachers and a, and a friend uh, was Sir Peter Strawson. And, you know, um, he was, well, I think underestimated for a while. And ironically, he has, you know, entered the limelight uh, uh, again, at least partly because he is uh, considered as a, as a major challenge to uh, conceptual engineering. I think wrongly so, but that's a different issue. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that, uh, you know, productive misinterpretation has brought uh, Peter's work uh, back uh, to the fore. Okay, so now I already indicated that, you know, I'm interested in conceptual analysis and analytic philosophy, and this is my motto, asked at a party what he actually did an analytic philosopher replied, you clarify a few concepts, you make a few distinctions, it's a living. And uh, I think that uh, conceptual engineering doesn't move that far away from this idea. At any rate, uh, uh, you know, I'll try to uh, interest you in that thesis. But to many of you, this will come uh, sound like something from the past, but let's hope it's at least a bit of a blast from the past. So here's the preview. I'll first talk about not conceptual connections, but historical connections between conceptual uh, analysis, conceptual engineering and experimental philosophy. Um, then I'll uh, indicate what my aim is. It you know, is still pretty much the one indicated in the abstract. Um, then I'll defend the idea that conceptual analysis and uh, conceptual engineering have got something to do with concepts, um, which uh, you know, I think requires defense. Uh, uh, but what requires perhaps even more def uh, of uh, uh, a rescue measure is uh, a defense of analysis, the idea that um, elucidating, uh, understanding concepts um, is, uh, uh, well, a precondition for sober philosophizing, including conceptual engineering. Um, and then, well, you know, if we get to that, uh, I will talk about uh, what concepts are, lessons from and for conceptual analysis, but they, they are also, I think, lessons for conceptual engineering. Uh, we may not get to that, but, uh, and then, well, but we certainly won't get to uh, two appendices, namely, uh, you know, I, I was going to uh, illustrate the way I conceive of what I call impure conceptual analysis, um, by looking at the case of animal minds, but you know, I'll let you off on grounds of, of good behavior. Okay, historical connections. Now, obviously analysis uh, was uh, eponymous for uh, the movement of analytic philosophy, um, but contrary to you know, recent uh, opinions, it also played and continues to play a central role in its self image and in its practice, you know, that's a, a thesis I, I, I uphold. Um, 
Now, I think those who deny uh, that conceptual analysis played any role at all, or analysis more generally played a role in, in philosophy, uh, may be misled by the diverse forms that analysis can take. You know, they're very uh, diverse and partly incompatible um, conceptions uh, and practices of analysis. Uh, to begin with, there's um, the contrast between paraphrasing propositions by way of logical analysis and defining or explaining concepts um, in the style of Moore um, and uh, Oxford, uh, so-called ordinary language philosophy, but also I think Wittgenstein. Uh, there's also the very important uh, contrast between revisionist and non-revisionist analysis. There is not just uh, non-revisionist or descriptive analysis, there's also such a thing as revisionist analysis. Um, how this can be is an interesting question, but I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, I will admit someone. Um, uh, and there is the, connect, uh, the distinction uh, uh, famously drawn by Strawson between atomistic, reductive, and connective analysis. And um, so these are just some of the you know, versions that analysis can take. And um, just uh, as a final remark on uh, the claim that uh, you know, analysis uh, indeed did play a central role in um, and indeed, uh, descriptive analysis uh, did play a, a, a central role in um, analytic philosophy. It's clear that uh, seminal versions of logical analysis of the propositional uh, of propositional paraphrase, which are usually allocated to ideal language philosophy, are in fact non-revisionist. I mean, I think I can really demonstrate this, not just for the Tractatus, but also for Donald Davidson. It's not a revisionist project. It's The project is to uh, unearth the logical form and the, the logico-semantic apparatus underlying natural languages all along. So, you know, that's just, you know, one uh, piece of evidence for the idea that uh, conceptual analysis is uh, and logical analysis and indeed descriptive analysis are uh, important to uh, analytic philosophy. Now, uh, I think there's another reason why people uh, 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 sometimes dismiss uh, the, the importance of analysis. It may be, you know, this may be fueled by the idea that non-revisionary conceptual analysis uh, boils down to, or at least presupposes an appeal to intuitions. And people like Hermann Kaplan, you know, rightly think that, uh, you know, well, A, that uh, the appeal to intuitions um, isn't that important in the history of analytic philosophy. And they also rightly, uh, I think, question um, the adequacy of such an appeal to intuitions. Uh, as far as that is concerned, I'm completely on their side. How I, you know, such an appeal was indeed important only in certain areas of analytic philosophy, I mean, moral and political philosophy, and in certain periods, I mean, roughly since the 1980s. Um, but uh, I don't think that uh, the appeal to uh, intuitions is essential to descriptivist conceptual analysis, not to mention other forms of analysis. The guiding idea is not to appeal to intuitions, but the guiding idea is that of making explicit concepts uh, that are employed either within a linguistic community or in the con uh, context of a philosophical argument. So, you know, not an appeal to intuitions, but the idea of explicating, spelling out uh, something which was, you know, which uh, was implicit before. That seems to me the guiding idea. It's not an unproblematic idea. Um, if I get a chance to talk about, um, you know, section five, um, we'll see what I think it amounts to, but it certainly is something different from appealing to intuitions. Okay, so, uh, it seems to me historically uh, the disputes surrounding these different forms of analysis provide the starting point both for conceptual engineering, CE in the sequel, and for experimental philosophy. Oops, yeah, apologies for the typo. Both of them are to a large extent reactions to the shortcomings, actual or perceived, 
of non-revisionist of descriptive conceptual analysis. Um, and con uh, conceptual engineering is also at least partly a continuation of the revisionist analysis of concepts of the kind of logical construction that Carnap and Quine uh, engaged in. Okay, so I think, you know, historically speaking, I can, I, I think I can defend this against all comers, but, um, you know, the fact that there's historical continuity between conceptual analysis and conceptual engineering doesn't entail that the two uh, uh, projects are, you know, continuous in, in substantive terms, in philosophical terms, it doesn't even follow that the two are philosophically compatible. And, you know, I, I will uh, devote most of this talk to uh, addressing the suspicion that they are not compatible. Um, this brings me to my aim. Um, I think uh, there is a sort of seminal uh, classification of approaches or of, to experimental philosophy by Nadelhofer and Nemeyers. Um, and, you know, I have sort of abstract from the details, and I think that there is a parallel taxonomy of uh, types of conceptual engineering with respect to their attitudes towards conceptual analysis. There is modification and extension. I mean, that ranges from very moderately revisionary, uh, as in Bernard Williams, to radically revisionary, as in Sally Haslanger. Um, there's repudiation. I mean, Herman is a prime example in NATO. Um, and there's indifference, um, you know, just as some experimental philosophers uh, are indifferent to, you know, conceptual analyses. Um, I think, uh, but I don't know enough about uh, particular instances, but you could imagine that, you know, people who uh, engage in applied uh, conceptual engineering in the implementation problem beyond philosophy, uh, as uh, uh, Burgess and, and Kaplan have no, uh, no, uh, Blunkett and Kaplan have, have put it, you know, they might just be indifferent to these uh, problems. So my thesis, or I should rather say my views, I'm not going to uh, address all of them. My uh, uh, thesis is that B and C, I mean, modification and uh, indifference are untenable since conceptual engineering and conceptual ethics presuppose conceptual self-understanding. Um, uh, uh, on an aside, I'm not going to draw um, any uh, systematic distinction between conceptual engineering and conceptual ethics. I'm happy to talk about this in in the uh, uh, in the Q and A. But you know, for me, I, I'll talk about conceptual engineering. So you know, I think um, you know you can only engineer things you understand, and you can only engineer concepts if you. Uh, have uh, uh, at least a, a, some degree of conceptual self-understanding and that requires conceptual elucidation. Uh, now, A, the modification and extension of uh, concepts is in my view, coherent, legitimate and indispensable. And picking up a remark I made before, um, I don't think anything in Peter Strawson or those following him suggests otherwise. And thirdly, while uh, you know, uh, Project A is uh, in, you know, entirely uh, positive, I think in many areas, not in all areas, but in many areas, uh, it, it is outside the remit of philosophers. Conceptual engineering, i.e. concept formation in physics, for example, is best done by physicists. Call me a naturalist, but you know, um, that's, uh, that's my view. Okay. Um, okay, in, in, my, uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, I shall uh, be concerned with criticizing B. Actually, I found that it has a rather unhealthy uh, focus on Hermann's work, um, simply because I started to get into the details of this, and I, I thought that this was the most interesting uh, case of uh, repudiating conceptual um, uh, engineering that I found, and you know, I I am um, I hope for feedback uh, on this score. Okay, so you know, B is you might call it exclusionary uh, conceptual engineering. Uh, so you know, it, it 
presents conceptual engineering as radically opposed and as replacing conceptual analysis. Um, now, you know, prima facie, uh, you know, it would appear to naive uh, people like me that improving conceptual schemes in a controlled and fruitful way presupposes an understanding of the conceptual status quo, right? You know, that's, that is a, my, was my naive na assumption when I uh, first came across conceptual engineering. Previously, I thought of it as, as uh, I, you know, concept formation. Um, and, you know, I think it, it is some, something that I, I intend to defend. Um, now, you know, given that at least prima facie plausible uh, suggestion, the condemnation of conceptual analysis by exclusionary conceptual engineers constitutes some, something of a paradox. And it seems to me that this paradox needs to be taken far more seriously than has been the case. You know, I think people should realize that, you know, it really requires uh, not just explanation, but a lot of defense, uh, you know, to suggest that we can engineer um, concepts um, without having some understanding. So, uh, you know, there's another, perhaps even more, more striking paradox, uh, the idea that conceptual engineering might abandon, you know, the notion of concepts. One reason why the first paradox has escaped notice is even more paradoxical. Um, exclusionary conceptual engineers like Herman do not believe in the existence of concepts. Now, you know, if you don't believe in the existence of concepts, you certainly don't believe in the possibility of improving them. You just can't uh, believe in the possibility of changing uh, a conceptual framework. Um, now, Herman is also skeptical about the prospects of improving the way we think and speak. Um, you know, uh, he's very skeptical about uh, the possibility of, imp 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 uh, of implementation, um, partly because of his particular type of externalist semantics. Um, if we don't know what we mean by our words, you know, it's not clear that we know how to improve what we mean. I'm not going to dwell on that, but, you know, on all of this, I'm sh sharply opposed, uh, uh, but I won't get to that. Um, um, I will focus on, you know, uh, well, uh, uh, I think uh, these points here, the, you know, the two paradoxes, uh, first, conceptual engineering without concepts, and secondly, uh, the um, idea that uh, conceptual engineering excludes and supersedes uh, conceptual self-understanding. So in doing so, I'll appeal to conceptual analysis on the one hand, that's, you know, I mean, I think some conceptual connections, but I'll also appeal to common sense. Um, I know that common sense is a bit of a dirty word in many quarters, uh, not least in, in uh, people interested in, in revisionist methods uh, and uh, in conceptual engineering, not um, among all of them, but among, the, among many of them, it's a, it's a dirty word. But on this, I hold with uh, Brentano, uh, by far the most popular alternative to common sense philosophy has been common nonsense philosophy. And so I will, you know, uh, no, not shy away from, from appealing to common sense. Okay, uh, now I will also indicate, if uh, time permitting, a conception of conceptual analysis that I think harmonizes with conceptual engineering. Okay. In defense of concepts. So, uh, you know, concepts appear to be a common denominator between, you know, these three paradigms that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, or Pied de la Lettre, they are what conceptual analysis analyzes, defines, explains, explicates, elucidates um, through a priori armchair reflection. They are what uh, experimental philosophy investigates empirically, uh, you know, um, and, oops, sorry, I 
I have my problem with this. And they are what conceptual engineering engineers, forms, modifies, or ameliorates. Yeah. Nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, I think it's mainly Hammond. I think that uh, we should abandon that uh, uh, apparatus of concepts. Concepts construed as the theoretical entities that some philosophers and psychologists appeal to play no significant role in understanding conceptual engineering. Consequently, uh, Herman admits that the label conceptual engineering is a misnomer uh, adopted exclusively for aesthetic reasons. Um, yeah. um, instead, conceptual engineering is the activity of assessing and developing improvements of our representational devices. I think it's plural, sorry. Um, and the reason why you nonetheless stick to the label conceptual engineering uh, is that representational device engineering um, does not roll off uh, the tongue easily. Now, uh, yeah, you know, Hammer does not purport to prove that one cannot conceive of conceptual engineering as an enterprise involving concepts. But in fact, the only argument he as much as appeals to is directed only against the idea that there are principles constituting concepts or that there are conceptual truths. Uh, now, even if that case were uh, you know, valid, I don't think it is, I don't think it would show that there are no concepts. Um, and what I think is, is equally striking, at least from my perspective, replacing concepts by representational devices is a case of obscurum per obscurius. Um, it's a, a verschlechtbesserung, as one very nicely says in German, um, an, im, an imworse improvement. Um, why? Well, the notion, you know, even if we leave aside devices, representation uh, is a, a notion that is, I think, even more diverse and contested than that of concepts. Of course, one of the reasons I say this is one of my numerous philosophical privations is that I'm not a representationalist. So, you know, I know this puts me beyond the pale for some people, but, you know, it, it, I'm not alone in this calamity. And so I, uh, you know, I, I would just like to register that, uh, you know, as uh, there are people who, who don't take representation as, as the magic word. Um, now, it seems to me the only sense in which representation, the notion of representation, is clear, uncontested, and pertinent to the aspiration of understanding or improving the way we think and speak about the world is as follows. Sentences or propositions have truth conditions, and concepts or predicates have conditions of application. That seems to me the only you know, uh, sense in which, you know, for instance, a predicate represents or in which uh, a sentence represents that is clear, uncontested and pertinent. But in that case, it seems to me no improvement is in sight for explaining either conceptual analysis or conceptual engineering. You know, you, you, know, you explain representation by reference to, well, ultimately, I think, propositions and concepts, and then, you know, uh, we haven't really made much headway. Okay, so um, perhaps, uh, you know, Herman can bypass uh, the will or the wisp of representational devices by the idea that conceptual engineering is concerned with things, with the world, rather than with either language or concepts or thought. Um, so here's a quote. What I have described is a process that operates directly on extensions and intentions, i.e. things in the world. In that sense, the process I describe as conceptual engineering is about knowledge, freedom, what is right, women, marriage, and salad. Well, obviously. It's not about the words, and it's not about concepts. I don't appeal to any. When doing conceptual engineering, we are deciding how these things, i.e. knowledge, freedom, uh, marriage, salad, should be. Um, it's a striking claim, really, especially if you think about salad. Um, but uh, 
if, you know, uh, Herman quite rightly uh, emphasizes that there is an obvious element of truth in the idea that conceptual engineering concerns words and their meanings. The kind of change that conceptual engineering aspires to bring about is a, a matter uh, not of uh, changing the world, but of changes in extension that are driven by changes in intention. Uh, I mean, intentions, of course, to many people, uh, the inten intentions of, of uh, predicates are uh, you know, concepts by any other name, but I, I, I won't dwell on that. Now, uh, I think uh, coming, you know, helping back to the init initial quote, um, we must distinguish uh, two things one might operate on. You could operate on extensions, and extensions are sets and therefore abstract entities, or you could operate on the elements of those sets, on objects within the extensions, and these can, of course, be concrete. Now, it seems to me, barring linguistic idealism of the most uh, implausible kind, uh, uh, conceptual engineering can alter what the extension of an expression is by altering its intention, but it cannot alter objects within that extension. And then I really don't see why this should not be something that uh, pertains in the first instance uh, to language, why this should be something that uh, pertains in the first instance uh, 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 to the world. Um, so what we are improving, I don't think is things, but how we think about things. Uh, now, a parental counselor can change the extension of parental neglect. So, for instance, by improving the relationship between Jim and his daughter Sarah, yeah, he can reduce the uh, extension of parental neglect by, you know, one pair, ordered pair. Uh, but of course, changing the extension of parental neglect through, you know, redefining it, for instance, in a legal context, can't alter, uh, you know, its extension in this direct way. Um, so, you know, nevertheless, it can alter the, uh, 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 you know, the extension in some respect, and it can even improve, but not things in the world, but things. So, you know, neither CA nor CE can operate on individual Fs, but they can both be equally about the world, both clarifying and modifying the concept F concerns what an F is, i.e. what constitutes or counts as an F. You can, you know, you can change that. You can alter the conditions of application of uh, the predicate F. Um, and in that way, both of these enterprises can improve things, not you know, objects, material objects, but they can improve how things are or how things are going by elucidating or modifying how we think, speak, and argue about them. So I don't think that... Um, now, there is a sense in which conceptual engineering is about the, the world, but, uh, you know, uh, by clarifying, about I mean, altering what you know, what constitutes or counts as, as uh, satisfying a concept. But, you know, in that way, uh, in that indirect way, a conceptual analysis can equally, you know, be about the world, as some people have, to have, have, uh, have um, emphasized. I mean, Ozzy Hanfling, for instance. Now, um, I think, uh, nonetheless, uh, Hermann is dead right in the following complaint. Those who talk of conceptual engineering as operating on concepts often just talk about concepts, the engineering, and then leave it at that. That's unfortunate because it makes the view hard to assess. You don't really have an account of conceptual engineering unless you make an explicit choice here between a choice between different conceptions of concepts. Uh, assuming you're someone who thinks of conceptual engineering as operating on concepts. So that's my emphasis. Uh, and, you know, I think this challenge applies, uh, you know, uh, analogously to conceptual analysis. A lot of people talk about conceptual analysis and spend no time at all explaining, you know, what they take concepts to be. However, uh, this quote and very, uh, you know, I think this very forceful quote provides me with an opportunity 
to wade in on behalf, not just of concepts, but of analysis. Yeah, the challenge that uh, is posed in the passage is to explain what concept and its cognates mean, at least in a given context, since otherwise you don't really have an account of what it means to say that conceptual engineering operates on concepts. And that, as Hermann uh, quite rightly observes, makes the view hard to assess. Now, in my view, that's just grist to the mill of conceptual analysis. Uh, Equally, I find you know some uh, soccer in uh, something that um, Kaplan and Plunkett uh, write at the beginning of their collection. Namely, they applaud um, having observed uh, you know uh, that key terms of the conceptual engineering project are used in different ways, and they uh, say you know they should make this explicit um, uh, so that one knows what's going on, what they are proposing. But it, it seems to me that willy nilly reinforces the need for conceptual analysis. Um, so I think, although this is a bit ad hominem, but I think I'm appealing to, to uh, things that uh, exclusionary conceptual engineers write, which you know, I think are important for conceptual engineering and which in my view uh, indicate that conceptual understanding is needed. Uh, now, at a minimum, it seems to me, any project which, uh, you know, uh, carries the flag of con as conceptual engineering must aim at uh, improving the way we categorize and reason about phenomena. Um, and, you know, it should be different from altering specific beliefs and theories as in normal scientific theory formation. Now, I mean, you know, conceptual engineering must alter the way we think about the world, the way we think about the world and not, you know, individual things we, we uh, think about the world. Um, and, you know, that seems to me uh, requires a conceptual clarification um, um, as, you know, a, 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 you know, a really hardcore naturalist even, uh, concedes, without some conceptual clarification, we will be in the dark concerning our subject matter. You know, what am I talking about when I'm talking about um, conceptual engineering, when I'm talking about uh, ameliorating concepts? Um, now, uh, Hermann nevertheless rejects this idea emphatically uh, in a passage from which I think uh, yeah, well, I just have to quote at, at some length. Okay, so all the, um, he calls this the anti-descriptivist, no, anti-descriptive argument. So uh, here it starts. If your aim is to think about and understand some important philosophical phenomenon, you have to figure out how best to think and talk about those phenomena. The best way to think, talk and think about, say, freedom isn't just to think and say true things about freedom, it is also, and just as importantly, to figure out how to represent freedom in language and thought. Now, I think two, two things. Um, one uh, harks back to what I said before. It seems that um, the way in which um, Hammond can insist on conceptual engineering being about the world um, does not exclude it being uh, about language and thought. And, you know, it seems to me that it doesn't really, uh, you know, uh, put any uh, clear water between conceptual engineering and conceptual analysis. In the first instance, we are concerned with the way in which we uh, think and speak. Uh, second remark, the passage acknowledges that conceptual engineering is concept formation rather than belief formation. He says, isn't just to think and say true things, right? I mean, trying to say true things would, you know, acquire, would be to uh, try to acquire and express uh, true beliefs. But, you know, we are, we are talking about something more fundamental. And, and Herman is also very, uh, I think, uh, explicit about it being in some way more fundamental. Um, but, you know, the passage, so to that, uh, up to that point, I could underwrite that passage, I think. Um, but uh, the passage 
continues uh, by denying that uh, conceptual understanding has any role to play. And here's the next um, quote. And here you know, the emphasis is on uh, the terms improvement and assessment. We have reason to think that our current way of representing freedom, and this is just an example, I think Herman thinks we have reason to think that our current way of representing anything is defective. And so before we start trying to figure out truths about freedom, we need to find out how best to represent it. This kind of inquiry is essentially a normative enterprise. It asks how best to represent those phenomena and what might be defective about current ways of representing them. The assessment and improvement of concepts is at the core of philosophical practice, no matter what the topic. Your goal cannot be purely descriptive. Yeah, well, you know, once again, you know, you won't be surprised that at least to, you know, a, a naive um, uh, character like me, this uh, provokes the question, well, how can you rationally uh, assess concepts rationally assess concepts without understanding them. And I'll, I'll bracket the question of whether we should say concepts or representational devices here, as does, uh, does uh, Herman uh, uh, for the most part. So how can you rationally you know, adjudicate whether uh, a concept or a certain part of a, con uh, a certain conceptual framework is any good without understanding it? Uh, oops. Now, uh, Herman is alive to this point, um, and he has, you know, he's, he recognizes that there's a descriptivist rejoinder to his anti descriptive argument. Doesn't the anti descriptive argument assume that we first engage in important descriptive work, figuring out whether our concepts are defective and how they can be improved? Surely that's a descriptive task, isn't it? I would have thought so. Um, but, uh, not uh, Herman, he gives a response, uh, uh, which I think is a straightforwardly skeptical response. I, in fact, it's, 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 uh, it's just hyperbolical doubt about uh, uh, concepts. Uh, you know, he alludes to an argument which he's developed, the prudential argument that our concepts are defective has no limit. It applies equally to the terms that occur in the reply to the anti-descriptive argument above. In other words, all the concepts involved in describing the critical constructive project of conceptual engineering should themselves be subject to constant critical assessment and skepticism. In particular, we will need to assess the following concepts, concept, conceptual defect, descriptive work, etc. The very terminology in which you engage in the critical project is itself subject, sub, suspect. Of course, even this articulation of the self-reflective nature of the core revisionist argument, his argument, oops, should be subject to that very same kind of criticism. And now you'll probably be sorry to hear that's uh, you know, the end of my uh, quoting Hermann. Instead, you're just going to get uh, inferior stuff by me. It seems to me that this, uh, this um, line of argument won't do. And it won't do um, uh, for a reason which I think applies to hyperbolical doubt uh, more generally, namely that uh, the home advantage lies not with the skeptic, but with those who go about their business their cognitive business. Um, now, Herman acknowledges that, you know, what I call hyperbolical doubt about concepts also applies to itself. So, you know, the very notions that he uses in attacking uh, our conceptual framework and in uh, attacking descriptivist conceptions of, of philosophy is suspect. Uh, but, you know, it seems to me that commits him to bracketing uh, or abandoning his own concepts and thereby, I think, in the ultimate run to silence. You know, this is not, I mean, the, 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 this is where the fact that this is a, a doubt, hyperbolical doubt about concepts comes in. If you think, you know, as a young Ludwig thought that, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, 
certain imp, imp, saying certain things or, or well trying to say certain things is itself precluded or illegitimate then i think you are ultimately stuck with the idea whereof one cannot speak thereof one should remain silent he cannot legitimately accost conceptual and analysts for employing their concepts. If I talk about concepts, then I think Herman has no leg to stand on um, because you know, he can't even formulate his, uh, his doubts without uh, falling, uh, you know, without uh, inviting uh, the charge of self-refutation. Whereas his opponents are under no obligation to bracket or abandon their concepts. I'm here. I am. I'm, I'm the guy mentioned at the party. You know, I, I uh, clarify a few concepts. I draw a few distinctions. And here someone comes along and says, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. But incidentally, who knows whether the term should makes any sense. Right. And that's what it ultimately amounts to. So poof. You know, now, of course, you, you know, so I think the, the, uh, the onus is on the skeptic to provide a reason for doubting uh, the concepts that uh, uh, ordinary folk, in that case, ordinary philosophers um, uh, employ. And, uh, you know, that reason cannot be self-refuting. Otherwise, you know, it, it just simply won't even enter the, the domain of debate. The unjustified doubt simply saying, well, all of our concepts might be, um, I mean, you know, this is with uh, apologies to Socrates. Uh, uh, the unjustified doubt is not worth examining. Yeah? And if uh, any attempt to, uh, uh, to uh, justify the doubt, and of course Herman provides all many of these attempts, is by its own lights um, uh, of dubious intelligibility, then I think we don't even have a case to address. So that would be my line on this. Okay, um, as I said, I, I've said uh, more negative things and more specifically on Hammond, but that's because I, I got just intrigued by this line of argument. Mm. Let me now accentuate the positive concepts. As I said, Herman's challenge to explain what, con you, know, what you mean by concepts, irrespective of whether you're analyzing or uh, modifying them, uh, I think is very well taken. Um, I do think that conceptual analysis provides a way of meeting the challenge. I think there's a way of capturing most of the established uses of the term concepts in, in uh, domains like philosophy, logic, psychology, conceptual history or intellectual history, history of ideals. Um, and I think this is that concepts are best conceived as principles or rules of intellectual op operations, uh, operations like classification and inference. I mean, I've argued for this uh, in, in several places. So, you know, here I'm just... Uh, uh, you know, alluding to that. Um, so, but the take home message here, which I haven't uh, you know, vindicated is that concepts are not bona fide entities. They're not abstract or mental or neural thingy things. Uh, they're, you know, they are not things that structure propositions. They're not mental representations. They are not neural processes and they don't, I mean, sorry, this is garbled. And they don't, they are not components of structured propositions either. You know, so forget this reifying idea of, of concepts. Um, concepts are principles or rules. And to have a concept is not to have a mental representation, but to have a certain repertoire of abilities. Uh, so uh, if that's right, then the analysis of concepts is not the decomposition of complex entities into parts. It is the articulation or explication of the rules uh, by which we perform certain intellectual or uh, linguistic operations. Uh, by the same token, conceptual engineering is the construction or modification of these rules and principles. Um, now, uh, what is problematic about this? Uh, and here I'm perhaps thinking more of the challenge from uh, 
uh, experimental philosophy than from conceptual engineering. Um, one could say, well, but you know, intellectual or linguistic operations, uh, they are themselves part of uh, the mental or linguistic reality. So they're really you know, a topic for empirical investigation. Um, and it's uh, uh, of course true that the empirical investigation of conceptual thinking is a task for various empirical disciplines. Um, 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 so, you know, for, for concepts, this could be psychology or neuroscience. Uh, for uh, language, this could be uh, empirical linguistics. Um, but conceptual analysis deals with expressions and in particular the meaning of these expressions or the rules uh, of inference or reasoning from a particular perspective and for a distinct purpose. Um, now here um, uh, comes something which I, I've, I wish more people could take note of. Um, so, you know, conceptual analysis is not uh, concerned with Ac uh, accurately describing a specific linguistic practice or uh, describing or causally explaining how that uh, linguistic practice came about. Um, it clarifies concepts for a particular philosophical or call it dialectic purpose. Um, it uh, clarifies concepts by articulating the rules according to which terms are used in a particular context, in a particular line of philosophical reasoning, in a particular problem setting, or if one extends this beyond philosophy, as well as I think one should, um, in particular lines of argument or in particular research programs. You know, I think that is, uh, you know, the really a, one way of, of thinking of critical thinking. So we, we don't describe uh, in order to find out what people, um, you know, uh, for instance, in the Kirkley Islands are up to, we articulate the rules according to which uh, certain expressions are used in a certain conversation of a philosophical or more generally um, cognitive kind. So uh, the conceptual analyst does not adopt the external perspective of psychology or linguistics. Uh, she may articulate her own understanding of a philosophically pertinent expression, but she may also uh, uh, spell out the understanding which she thinks are operative in the questions or statements or arguments of an interlocutor. You know, so you ask, what do you mean? And then you explain what you mean. And then you see how these things uh, square up concerning a certain uh, question or claim or argument. Now, you know, having said that, you know, it, it is context dependent uh, conceptual analysis, but of course it draws on uh, something like a shared language. Uh, normally philosophical explications of concepts will start out from an understanding of these expressions, which is shared within uh, the linguistic community to which the interlocutors belong. Um, why? Well, you know, for one thing, the primordial and most fundamental philosophical questions are couched in terms of shared natural languages. There are plenty of philosophical questions which concern technical expressions and, and technical conceptual frameworks, but the most fundamental questions, you know, uh, is there such a thing as truth? Are there uh, objectively binding moral principles, what distinguishes uh, the meaningful statement of a human being from the squawkings of a parrot and so on and so forth. You know, am I free to decide uh, to abandon this talk right now? You know, all of these are framed in terms of natural languages. Um, and that holds not just for ethical questions and problems concerning the mind, but also for semantic questions. I registered this because, you know, that if I had uh, two hours, I would go on uh, arguing why that is important. Um, anyway, but, you know, so what do we do? Uh, assuming that we are trying to get clear about the meaning of expressions for a particular purpose in a particular context, but, you know, draw on 
uh, the background of a common shared language. And what then do we do when we engage in conceptual analysis? Um, now, one thing is clear that, you know, the knowledge that conceptual analysis aspires to, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I think all knowledge uh, presupposes learning for its genesis. You can't, you know, have that kind of knowledge uh, without a particular learning process. Uh, but nevertheless, this knowledge is not empirical because its epistemic warrant is different. Uh, the warrant, uh, to put it very bluntly and in ways which invite, I'm sure, devastating objections, is one's own lingu linguistic or conceptual competence. Um, conceptual analysis articulates an understanding obtained as part of the immersion into a shared linguistic practice. You know, it's, it's an understanding that we obtain as part of uh, language acquisition and socialization and inculturation. Um, it makes explicit something that uh, Dick Hare long ago called participatory knowledge. Um, and this participatory knowledge, according to Hare and later according to uh, Hanfling, is akin to the kind of knowledge which guides other social practices, such as a game or a dance. Um, it's just way more complicated. Um, we explicate the logical semantic rules, and they are very flexible and context dependent and hard to nail down. But anyway, we, we try to explicate the logical semantic rules governing a practice, a practice into which we have been induced and which we have mastered and in which we participate willy nilly. It's not something we can simply, you know, uh, get out of. Now, the enterprise of explicating these rules um, is, I think, immensely difficult and it is fallible, as indeed is, I think, uh, conceptual engineering. I think by most uh, accounts, it's, it's not as easy as it may seem. So like conceptual engineering, conceptual analysis is difficult and fallible, but I don't think it's either impossible, nor do I think it's pointless. And on that happy note, uh, or rather on that rather uh, optimistic note, uh, I will stop. Thank you.